Every now and then, you stumble upon an artist that makes an impression. It struck me that a number of media artists in Europe came from Canada, and that many of them were students of Norman White, pioneer of electronic and interactive art. Over the years, I came across his installations with light bulbs, like first tighten up on the drums, and his light mural, Splish Splash 2, made for the office of the Canadian Broadcasting Company in Vancouver. I saw the helpless robot, and facing out, laying low, and a lot more of Norman White's robotic work, humorous machines that seem to have a life of their own. I'm a tinkerer, that's the way I like to look at myself. A person who likes to fiddle and tinker, and the, the only thing that makes me an artist is that I can get by with showing it in art galleries if I want to. This is, to me, a very important part of what aesthetics is. You know, if two people make a film that's very similar and one person spends a million dollars making a film and another person spends ten thousand dollars, to me the person who spent ten thousand dollars is the greater artist. You know, the economy of means. Uh, and, yeah, I... Why? It's just because we waste so much in our Western society, throw away, we, you know, we, we shoot far more footage than we need to because we believe, ah, oh, well, there's a cutting room floor, we can always get rid of it and charge it to the consumer, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, or we, um, we just buy stuff pell-mell that we're never going to use. So I, I try to accumulate uh, stuff that people are throwing out, and it's 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 not something I do out of guilt or or anything like that. I actually enjoy it. It gives me great pleasure to take stuff that people are throwing out and re repurpose it and use it again. If somebody tomorrow gave me a million dollars, I would still do it. We visited Norman White in an old water mill in Durham, Ontario, where he builds and experiments with kinetic electronics. The lady who lived across the street, that, uh, who had the daughter that I mentioned just recently, um, she was a former student of mine, and uh, she knew I was looking for an industrial space. I used to bicycle through all the back alleys of Toronto looking for a little garage or a little back alley industry, industrial building where I could, uh, you know, rent. And I never found one. But um, nevertheless, the word got out. And when this building came up for sale, she called me up right away and said, Norm, there's this building going across the street and it's going very cheaply and you really got to check it out. You're going to love it. So I came out on a Thursday night, um, had a look at it, thought, oh man, it's way too big. I can't handle this. It's beautiful. I love it, but it's way too big. Then I went back to Toronto, thought about it, just changed my mind came back on a Sunday, signed the contract, and Monday there were seven people trying to outbid me. And it's been, you know, when we first bought it, it was smelly, the roof leaked terribly, um, dusty, uh, filled with rat and raccoon carcasses, and very, very gross kind of place. But we worked on it intensely for about five years and get to the point where it's now reasonably comfortable and I love the space, I love the the volume of air around me when I go into certain rooms. Pardon me? And the bats. And the bats, yeah, I love the bats, yeah. Wow. So, this is my survival room. My bed's up there in the kitchen, computer, 
small space, but if nothing else gets heated, it's this room. Okay, so in wintertime you're here? Yeah, in the wintertime I'm here, and also that little shop at the uh, on the end there. So this is my clean room, my so-called clean room, uh, where I do the electronic assembly and computer programming and stuff like that. Looks interesting, a lot of different stuff. And that's Dutch. Yeah, those belong to my grandmother. There's the two islands, um, Markham and what's the other one? Uh, Bolandam. I just love the faces on the kids, and it's all hand colored, of course. It's a very old, there were very old photographs. And in one shot, they're all wearing wooden shoes, and they look like the classic Dutch kids that we have in mythology. And then down at the bottom, they're all wearing leather shoes and looking very conservative. Well, it was a strange uh, union, my mother and father. My mother was very artistic, and my father was a military guy. So they had very different sensibilities, but they stuck it, they got, stuck it out for the full marriage. And um, yeah, my father was a career army guy. He was a doctor in, in the army. Uh, Air Corps, this before the Air, Air Force became a separate uh, part uh, of the military. And uh, after he graduated from medical school at Columbia, he went down to uh, Oklahoma. He was stationed in Oklahoma and then Texas and several places in Texas and everything. And I was born in San Antonio. As a teenager, I loved fishing and I thought if I could get a, a, a job in marine biology that it would be the perfect job because I could be around fish and so uh, I th went to uh, Harvard because they had uh, Woods Hole which was a marine biology center. As it turned out I never did get to Woods Hole but um, I did take, uh, I did graduate with a degree in biology but by the time I graduated I realized I'd be a very poor biologist. I, I like the natural history part of it, but the memorization of all the Latin names uh, just didn't click with me. In my last year at college, I took some courses in art, and I found I did very well in them without trying very hard, and my art teacher encouraged me that possibly my true calling was art. And because my mother was an artist, a Van Eyck and I always felt some kind of affinity with uh, the Van Eyck paintings and so forth that I should give uh, art a chance. So I moved to Greenwich. Well, actually, I started out moving to the Bronx and hanging out in Greenwich Village and eventually moved to Greenwich Village. Lived there about two years. Edward Schenken is an art historian specializing in contemporary art and new media. He takes a particular interest in Norman's work. Norm was, as you know, educated as a scientist at Harvard. He's a very, very bright guy. Um, the fact that he's an autodidact, I think, is significant for a couple reasons. One, he's taught himself everything that he knows, essentially. But he's also learned from a lot of different sources, and he's a, a, he reads widely. And uh, the fact that he's an autodidact is significant at this moment in time because we live in participatory culture in which do-it-yourself, DIY, is a really key element of cultural practices, how people act in the world. We're all engaged in making our own stuff now, to, to greater or lesser extent. And Norman White embodies that spirit and has pushed that spirit in his teaching and in his artwork for four decades. Oh, it was a wonderful time to be there because the abstract expressionists were, they weren't at their peak, but they were at their ebb. So we Franz Klein to Koenig, I would drink at the Cedar Street Bar and at the other end, surrounded by their followers, would be Koenig or De Koenig or Franz Klein. And uh, yeah, it was full of energy and you, you know, there was this Dionysian spirit where you got drunk at the bar and then you went home and threw paint at the canvas and so forth. 
and it was a very social, wild time, and and I just, you know, was saturated, and it was quite pleasurable. But of course, I wasn't making very good art in this time. I was, it was more of a social phenomenon for me. Uh, ended up in San Francisco, where after getting various odd jobs for a period of six months, I ended up getting a job for the naval shipyard as a civilian electrician and there I was put to work wiring up telephone switchboards uh, and I found I really loved that job. To see these uh, telephone switchboards filled with relays all writhing, every time you dialed a number the switcher would be it's very beautiful so and to see it come alive, had it had like a life, this telephone switchboard. I worked for the shipyard for about a year and a half and I saved up $2,000 and I was reading Henry Miller and Lawrence Durrell at the time, Alexandria Quartet about the Middle East, and I formed this fascination for Greece and the Middle East. So uh, I got uh, myself a ticket aboard a Yugoslav freighter and caught that freighter from New York to Tangiers. And to make a long story short, I basically hitchhiked from Tangiers to Calcutta. And when my money ran out, I um, hitchhiked to uh, to England. And there I got a job as a caretaker for a block of flats up in Hampstead. And there was an art school band just starting up at the time, a polytechnic band called the Pink Floyd, and I used to go to their concerts at Tottenham Court Road. What impressed me was the rawness of their of their technology. Uh, they had blow torches shining into slide projectors. And they had automobile headlights at, for strobes that were they were putting high voltage through. And um, it was there was a, a a a nice rawness to the technology. It wasn't slick at all. These are boards from the mural in Vancouver, Split Splash Two. Have a quick look at those. I, some of these I haven't seen in a while, to tell you the truth. Uh, the light mural was a 40-foot uh, wide, 8-foot tall uh, light mural which had a thousand, more than a thousand light bulbs which depicted raindrops falling on a pond with the circles spreading through each other, except instead of circles they were actually hexagons. Pretty. And it's been going for 31 years now. It was originally built in 75. And people who say that electric art never lasts will have to contend with the fact that this has been going for 31 years, 16 hours a day, seven days a week. And it's still going strong. In the beginning, I, would, I was still a painter. I still thought of myself as a painter, and I would sneak off very guiltily, and I would work on these things, and I was very interested in randomness, and how you, where the source of randomness, and how to emulate randomness, uh, because I'm very attracted to the idea of distancing myself from the, uh, the final effect of an artwork. I mean, I learned that a little bit from the abstract expressionists. When they threw the paint on the canvas, they were not in complete control. They would see what happened, and if it didn't suit them, they would throw more paint on the canvas. And so there was a kind of a deliberate attempt to distance themselves from precise control. I was very interested in te generating techniques that separated me from my intention. 
And electronics seem like a good way of doing it because you can build up these circuits where you set up the parameters and then you let it loose and you don't know what it's going to do, where it's going to lead you. This is this particular one I just put on the workbench for a minute. This is uh, one of the fucking robots, the male, the male fucking robot. The female is not here, it's uh, owned by Laura Kakauka who built the female. And so this shit, it's in uh, Meaford, which is not far from here. Um, this piece basically picked up the mechanic, uh, so, sorry, the, uh, what am I trying to say, the, uh, uh, the magnetic impulses from the female. This would be represent the female's vagina, mm -hmm. and it would fit over the penis like that, and when the female put out a current, it would cause the contraction and also send a pulse into the pickup, which was down there, which would then come up to the brain. Mm -hmm. The brain was here. There's a whole bunch of chips in there, mm -hmm. and that the brain was then responsible for making the breathing happen faster. These there's a motor here which makes the diaphragm or the, the lungs go faster. The motors that control the arms and the hips go faster, and and because the there's a microphone, you can sort of see it in there mm -hmm. as the the breathing goes faster and faster, the air rushes past the microphone and, you can, and there's an amplifier so you can hear this heavy breathing sound. So it's a very yeah. noisy very, couple. Yeah. <laughs> sort of thing. Norman White took us to visit Laura Kikauka, an intimate friend who organizes the annual Electric Eclectic Festival in Meaford, half an hour's drive from Norman's Mill. Every year, he helps build the event and meets with his former students. Yes, yeah, Norm was a huge influence, not just on me and so many people, but he made, uh, I mean, I went into art school thinking I would be doing visual works and everything like that, and then when uh, taking uh, uh, photoelectric arts, that was the name of the department, uh, he was, um, uh, it's, it's made it so easy to learn and fun, right? And he could explain things in such a humane way that uh, it was easy actually at the beginning. The, as soon as you learned how a switch worked, then you could apply it in many, many ways, right? And so that was just the beginning and it, it just grew from there. Yeah, the them fucking fucking robots was a uh, idea that Norm and I thought came up with based on a solenoid. When you put current through the coil, the rod is attracted, and that was how we started. I had the coil, and Norman had the rod, and we built it separately, and they were anatomically correct, and uh, uh, we had very funny technical phone calls like who's on top, who's on bottom, and angles and that. But it was a surprise for both of us because we didn't know if it would work when they come together.
Jeff Mann lives in Berlin and often attends the Electric Eclectic Festival to meet his old friends from the Ontario College of Art and Design. I was really fortunate to to go to that school and to be in that program and to have a teacher like Norm because I was really interested in, in electronics but um, I didn't really know that you could make art with electronics for a long time. There was a time when it was fairly easy to classify art. It was the Monet or the Emily Carr hanging in the gallery. Mozart played at the local concert hall. Now it isn't so easy. High technology has sparked a revolution in the artistic world, as well as some confusion with our old concepts of what art is. The computer has made inroads in all areas, leaving some artists wondering where technology ends and art begins. As the journal Sue Prestige reports, there's a fine line between art and science. Norman White began his career as a traditional artist. In fact, he still dabbles in drawing in his Toronto studio. But now his passion is creating art through technology. Along with Doug Back, a former sculptor, they've created a new way to reach out and touch someone. The art form is called telepresencing, sending and receiving sensations over the phone. So basically we have a, a device that's an arm wrestling machine created by Norman White myself. It feels position, information, comes out through a sensor, gets translated into electronic signal, goes out over the telephone line through a thing called a modem. So if someone who has the identical arm is, can be anywhere else in the world as long as they have a telephone, hooked up to that through the telephone line and Norman White's electronic box here. And if they move their arm, as is happening right here, um, this arm moves. And if I resist that movement, Get your elbow there. Okay, sorry. If I resist that movement, the other person's arm is slowing down right now. So it's as if I am actually grabbing that person's arm right now. But is this mass of wires and sensors really art? We're breaking ground and we don't really uh, half the time know whether it's art or not, nor is it important to us. The main thing is it's an exploration that we find tremendously um, intriguing and it somehow ties into everything that's happening around us. One of my favorite works by Norm White is a collaboration with one of his former students, Doug Back. And this work is called Telephonic Arm Wrestling. This emerged, they told me, out of a barroom conversation. This was during the, the sort of the, the uh, Soviet US tensions. And they thought wouldn't it be great if the uh, disagreements between the, the Russia and the U.S. could be solved with an arm wrestling match? So this gave them the idea. Let's create a device that will allow arm wrestling between the Kremlin and the White House. So they had this idea. They went to the engineering department at the University of Toronto. They said, we would like a force feedback unit that can communicate over a telephone wire to another force back force feedback unit, and they, you know, the engineers thought about it, and they said they could do it for something like $75,000, and it would take two years. Well, they needed it for an exhibition in three or four months, and they had nothing close to $75,000. So they went to that proverbial pile of junk, and they created it themselves. And what's wonderful about this work, Norm told me, is that it's very sensitive. You actually feel the sensation of muscle and sinew on one end or the other. Another thing that's fascinating about this work is that there is a time delay between one side and the other side. So both sides could simultaneously win or simultaneously lose, which defeats the whole principle of competition. So it's really a wonderful work that uses a sort of Einsteinian space-time continuum as a way of undermining the whole idea of, of competition and military uh, defense and, and all this stuff. I knew that I wanted to do creative things. I didn't want to just be an engineer and make products to sell to make lots of money. Uh, I wanted to do something creative. I was always working with 
music and building electronics for, for sound and things like this when I was younger. And um, this program at the Art College in Toronto was one of the only ones in the world, I think, at that time, where artists could go and learn um, technology and computers and really hands-on electronics and soldering and working with sensors and um, all kinds of technology like that. I started teaching at OCAD, uh, Ontario College of Art and Design, in 1978. And there was a guy there, Richard Hill, it was his name, who was very interested in the effects of digital the emerging digital technology on culture. He, did, he didn't know anything about technology. It was a funny story. When we first sat him down with a computer that had a mouse, he was slamming the mouse down on the desk saying, this isn't working, this isn't working. No, Richard, yes, you go this way, sideways, you know. <laughs> And uh, but anyway, he was a, a student of Marshall McLuhan, and he was very into what we used to call computer culture. What is the culture that is generated by the whole digital revolution? And uh, so, at the, I had by that time seventy eight. I'd been doing electronics for twelve years. And I was getting reasonably proficient at it. So. I started, he signed me on, and I started teaching electronics right off the bat in 1978. In fact, I think we were perhaps the first art school in the world where digital electronics was taught in an intense way. Well, the art world, even in 2011, is not particularly friendly to media art. And this varies depending on locale. Canada happens to be very uh, enthusiastic and embracing for media art. And Toronto is particularly uh, uh, strong in media arts. In the 80s, it was a very peripheral area of practice. And Norm really seized it in a variety of different ways, in addition to his early work with digital circuits and cellular automata. Hi, I'm Sandor Eisenstadt. I'm a student of, uh, well, I was a student of Norman's. In some ways, I still am a student of Norman's because he still helps me with, with my projects. Um, but uh, uh, back in, uh, in the late 80s, I, I took courses with him at art college and learned how to make electronic art, electronic sculpture. Yeah. Well, he taught me um, everything I know about digital electronics. Uh, right from uh, the very beginning, the first class I remember we went in with uh, basically nothing and we built a five volt power supply uh, in the first week and uh, then we could connect that up to digital circuits, integrated circuits and make LEDs flash on and off. And then he slowly introduced more complicated digital circuits counters, flip-flops, um, the 555, which is uh, not exactly digital, but it's very good for making all kinds of square waves. And, and, and so uh, right from the beginning, uh, we had a hands-on access to the, the technology, and we could make our own circuits that uh, did turn things on and off or control things in various ways or made sound. So you're working here? What are you working on? Um, well, I'm rebuilding the brain of the helpless robot. The helpless robot actually had two brains in it. One of the brains was to keep track of the motion. And that had to be done all the time in real time because the, the, the master's brain was take up, taken up uh, finding things to, appropriate things to say and saying them. And to be doing that at the same time 
doing this very time intensive business of keeping track of the motion was impossible. So I, I divided it up into two computers. One computer to take, uh, keep track of the emotion of the motion and the other one to keep track of that emotion. So anyway, this one using an old older system, uh, fourth embedded processor uh, that had fourth on board was the traditional way of doing it, but uh, since then I realized this is far more complicated than it needs to be, and I'm replacing that with a, uh, another board which will use a lot less power and is a lot simpler to maintain, and uh, that's what I'm working on now. Uh, it's the first time it broke down? Yeah, it's the first time it broke down. Traditionally, I've been working with wire wrap, I love doing wire wrap. I'm kind of among my friends. I'm known for my wire wrapping. But the trouble with wire wrapping is it has this depth to it. And uh, so I'm doing another version now using something called vector board. Can you uh, explain what wire wrapping is? Okay. In wire wrapping, you're, you have a very skinny wire. See how thin this wire is? It's just very very thin and you have a special tool and the tool in the middle has a, has a stripper on it and as I get older my hands get shakier and it's harder to do it right, so I've stripped the, the wire and say I wanted it to attach to that pin I put the wire in there there's two holes there's an outer hole and an inner hole put it on the outer hole, stick the pin on the, the central hole, and then twist it. The pin is square. The wire is silver plated. You see these are older wraps. They turn black just like your grandmother's silverware turns black. And it creates a airtight connection between the wire and the post without solder. The beauty of this is if you make a mistake, you use the other end of the wire wrapping tool and you go in reverse and it comes off. So it's easy to make changes. And especially where the pins are very close together, it's a push-pull system and one that I'm very fond of because it creates all these kind of beautiful arabesques mm. of wire. Graham Smith is one of Norman's first students. He now lives and works in Europe. Yeah, I, this was when we were involved in the uh, Strategic Arts in Initiative show with the arm wrestling robot. Uh, I was building a, another telepresence robot for this piece called Displaced Perspectives. And uh, I was working with Norm, uh, and we were all at the McLuhan program in Culture and Technology where Marshall McLuhan uh, did his early work. Um, and we were there with the curator, Derek de Kirchhoff. And I remember just the, the image of Norm sitting there with all of us talking about this very high technology stuff. And it appeared like he was like knitting, like some, he was knitting something. Like he really looked like, and he was, he was actually wire wrapping these, these circuit boards, which is a way to, to attach uh, 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 wires onto integrated circuits so you can take them on or off. But it was such a beautiful image of someone at peace as they're talking about this incredible technology they're inventing. He was kind of this, like, uh, um, you know, the godfather of, <laughs> it, it, you know, his, his reputation of being both a, a kind and incredibly influential teacher uh, through all his years at, at OCAD. I mean, he, he trained just about everybody around me. So, except me, of course, because I went to Ryerson. But then Ryerson, cleverly, uh, scooped him up the minute he uh, thought he might try to retire. <laughs> uh, so, you know, he, he's just incredibly influential in that way. Um, I guess that was how I first heard of him, in fact, was just knowing his influence on other people. Uh, it was very visible as well as uh, just talked about him and people openly acknowledging how he, you know, uh, got them on the path of creating their own uh, robots or media art. And, uh, yeah, so I think that was that was essentially his... Um, his aura or his, his, his um, what do I want to call it? Uh, his, the, the realm of his influence really uh, came from, stemmed from his teaching career as well as his work. And I think that's really important to, to acknowledge. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's strange because I, being in Germany for the last 13 years, mostly off and on, I kind of get out of sync with that because when you're out here, I, I know he's been teaching in Toronto, but then you see the waves and waves of generations of people that are still active with electronics and sculpture and uh, robotics and interactive works and it's, it's good to see because it's so um, rare because it's a very, uh, it's a kind of medium that uh, can come and go in fashion and as in, as in trends, right? where it's all of a sudden really an important medium and then it can also be very minimal too, like not many people working in that. So he always keeps it going. It was a kind of a small department in the school. It's one of the largest art schools in Canada. And a, a lot of the other departments weren't quite sure what we were doing. You know, the, the fine art people were just really like, we don't want to have anything to do with computers. Uh, computers don't have any place in art and so on. You know, at this time in the early 80s, it was it was pretty uh, new. It's a reading hour where that obit, the Matyoka sisters by Kanzaki Jujiro. See, now it's a little bit, uh, uh, what's the word, popular, you know, to, to learn to do websites and to work with computers and um, even now, it's starting to become kind of cool to work with, with electronics and these interface boards and sensors and everything. But at that time, it wasn't. And so all the people who, ha who, who went to this class were really interested in something that was, was really new. And so they only had the idea, you know, they were kind of unusual. <laughs> people they had really good motivation and really smart and were really interested like looking at the future um, you know so it was quite a kind of um, pioneering uh, group of people and and of course and of course Norman was a big part of that I was at the machine life exhibition in uh, Kingston Queen's College Agnes Etherington Art Center which was essentially an homage to Norm White and his contributions as a teacher, educator uh, to the arts in Canada. And some of the artists in that exhibition include uh, his students like Doug Back and David Rokeby. Rokeby is probably the best known of uh, white students and combines, in my mind, really the best qualities of Norman White, a brilliant mind engaged in really theoretically and conceptually fascinating issues and an extraordinary ability to figure out how to create something that conveys those ideas and allows people to experience them firsthand. And I think it's this quality of art and artists, of Norm White and his students, that's so significant. Allowing people to experience something, a model of the future in the present. Now we do, and actually even in Toronto, we uh, had apartments close by to each other there, and even an intercom. <laughs> we, let's say we're very close, <laughs> and uh, in more ways than I should mention on the camera, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but no, definitely soulmate. No, he doesn't work, he pleasurizes 
And that's the thing, that's the difference. Because it doesn't become work then, it's your pleasure. So, and that's always been, I mean, I feel the same way, so, but it's contagious, right? And there's also this insane humbleness to him. He's incredibly humble. And sometimes that would drive me crazy too, because it's a bit much where you think he's such a genius, genius he should be recognized. Well, I think uh, the attitude towards media art, I think it kind of goes on a cycle, actually. I don't think it goes in a straight line or even a curve, but it's, uh, it's this cycle of uh, media art um, having a little bit more acceptance in the mainstream art world. You know, maybe Corey Archangel has a show somewhere or something, or somebody does something clever. You see Vuk Kosick at uh, Freeze Art Fair or something. But it, it's never, uh, and then it kind of goes down again, and then people disappear. And there's always a dialogue, too, around uh, the skepticism in the, in the mainstream art world about accepting uh, media art and things like that. I guess it's hard to say, but I, I think it's a cycle. I think there's a kind of a, a shame of being part of, of media art or a, or a discomfort and a, and, a, um, and a tension with the mainstream art world. And then sometimes it's, it's okay. And you know, you can, you can ride with it and uh, yeah, see things at Freeze or at other uh, big showcases. But, but you see it at the Venice Biennale, for example, um, all of the media art stuff or a lot of it, gets uh, kind of segregated out to the sides. And it's really, you know, um, th this year there was the Bring Your Own Beamer shows, and, you know, it was off on some really difficult to get to island in the lagoon. It wasn't, you know, so so these things are not necessarily happening in the Giardini or in the Arsenale, and it's, uh, and anyway, so we have a ways to go yet. To me, art galleries are far too controlled a venue uh, with security guards standing around and all sorts of do's and don'ts applied to the space. Where I prefer something uh, a little more f like the Commedia dell'arte where un the unexpected can happen. So I, more and more I design work th that's not intended, um, the Helpless Robot is an example of that. It was never intended for an art gallery, it was intended for a shopping mall. It's kind of inspired by the old candid camera talking mailbox skit where your innocent person is passing by a mailbox and the mailbox said, Greetings, I am the new version X32 automated mailbox. Glad to be of service to you, you know? And then the friend said, Wow, that's amazing. Call this friend over, Hey, check it out, Fred. There's a talking mailbox. And the mailbox wouldn't talk, you know. It would just do nothing. Come on, say something. Mailbox would talk. Fred would finally walk away, and then mailbox said, "Welcome." This has no X32. So I love this, you know, that it would be this thing that would be placed in a in a kind of social setting with no explanation. This is getting like real frustrating. Don't screw up this time. Uh-oh, it's like, turn me too far. When we uh, curated the show uh, Schematic, and uh, this was showing at uh, Space New Media Arts in uh, London, we included the Helpless Robot in this show, and it was great to have it in the show. And Norm came and installed it himself, which was also wonderful to have him there. Uh, and there was a small technical problem. Um, he told us, no big deal, but we can't turn the robot off ever, so when we're shutting the show down to not turn it off, because he was worried about something on the motherboard, you know, it was, ah, he was worried if we shut it down, it just wouldn't start back up properly. So, okay, fine, that doesn't seem like a very big deal, so we left it, uh, left it on all the time, and then one morning I was the first person in the gallery and uh, opened up the door and heard something in the back, and I thought, that's weird, is somebody else here? So, walk to the back and all I hear is the helpless robot crying out, is anybody there? something very strange going on because I set this to 5 volts chip doesn't get hot. I put 5 volts from the power supply chip gets hot. I put it into the very same place and I measure both voltages they're both exactly 5 volts. It's 
what we call a quadrature input. There's two pulses coming in off this thing and one is leading the other or lagging behind the other depending on whether you're going positive or negative. Uh, clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, somewhere around 74, um, I st got started getting tired of working only in light and started thinking in terms of mechanical movement. And that's when Abacus and the ro robots on the ceiling, I started moving into a mechanical mode. A uh, mechanical is trickier because machines break down. Moving parts break down. Electronics can go on for a very, very long time without breaking down. There's no moving parts, no friction, no, no um, screws to come loose or anything like that. But I was nevertheless drawn to mechanics because I love the vulnerability of the machines. They kind of reflected my own vulnerability. This is uh, a reconstruction of facing out laying low, which was a robot that had ears. These are microphones with parabolic mics, parabolic reflectors and a computer on board and it looks stays in one place it's on a pedestal in the room and it basically looks for a variety in the room Rem remembers where there was activity in the past so what happens you walk in and then you see this thing and it it may or may not notice you if it's not looking at you it won't notice you but it, hopefully every now and then it looks over its shoulder to see if there's something it's missing and if it picks you up, either your sound that you're making or your motion, it will then remember you were there. It has a memory bank. If you hang around there too long, it will get bored with you and start looking somewhere else. And it responds to you with a kind of a Brownian trill, which is, has all sorts of elements built into it, which tell, it, tell you if it finds you novel or... or uh, exciting and stuff like that but it's a very kind of simplistic so but it talks to you it does it goes like blah, 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 sort of r2d2 type of voice and trying to break away from the hollywood robot imagery and just create this mysterious object that has no human quality at all yet the thing that you're interacting with is very, uh, at least in my attempts to make it, so very human. The point of Norm is is that not only is this he's a seminal artist. He's he's created works um, uh, like the, those fucking robots, the, uh, the helpless robot. These kinds of, of of seminal pieces that really show what the technology can actually do. But he's he's not so interested in becoming famous or becoming rich from this. He's interested in moving the field forward. He's interested in helping other people uh, create works to help move the field forward. He's interested in creating his own work to move the field forward. So you know, I, I think there's a he's not going to become the world's most famous artist in this century. But I think in the next century, when the technology has become Skypeized or Skyped. Um, so to speak, and it's become very simple to use, that people will look back and think of him as, as the Van Gogh of the day. I mean, the man has created some of the most amazing works ever created in this field. And uh, it's going to take time for the world to recognize that kind of genius that he is. But uh, the way Norm is, like wire wrapping or soldering or tinkering in his shop, He's just a wonderful person, and, uh, and that's what really comes through, is, is hum his humanity, his humility. And that's what I love about the guy the most. The important thing is that technology leads you down these roads that where you may have made a mistake or where some other principle intervenes. And if it's the engineer working alone, they'll just dismiss this and go and fix it and make it right. But quite often if there's an artist involved the artist will say wait a minute i like that keep it <laughs>